Welcome back, everyone. This is still the uh, task force on the implementation of the people waiting study. We are back after a short break, and we are going to hear from uh, Secretary Dan French. Um, good morning, Mr. Secretary. If you want to just introduce yourself and go ahead with your remarks. Uh, good morning. I'm Dan French, Secretary of Education, uh, and good morning to everyone, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I have provided some uh, written, written comments uh, to the task force uh, this morning, so hopefully you got a chance to see those or have a chance at some future date to review them. Um, you know, again, thank you for the opportunity to make some comments. Um, I have had some opportunity to read uh, the draft report, uh, not as much time as I would like, um, but I would just first say, you know, I, some impressions just on the style of it. I think it's uh, well done. Um, in, in particular, because these are very complex issues, and um, my impression is you you would you address the complexity uh, in some detail, but you also were able to translate that complexity into some actionable uh, options, which I think is always difficult to do. Um, but I, I couldn't also help but think that is increasingly difficult to do that in Vermont, um, not only because we have a very unique uh, education funding system. So, you know, you really have to understand Vermont and the Vermont system uh, to be able to uh, make sense of it. But also we have a lot of moving parts. Uh, you know, historically, as you know, we have um, many, many school districts in the state. So if you think about just the tasks of equalization, it would be one thing to equalize um, in a state like Maryland, perhaps that had 24 school districts, but you have 150 some odd. Um, but then the other challenge there is that we have uh, very small school districts. So we have, uh, in some cases, small groups of students that create a lot of volatility in numbers. So um, I see I see that play out all the time as a superintendent and tax rates would swing. So I think, you know, uh, kudos to the group for, um, you know, addressing this complex uh, topic in a very complex context. Um, and again, I'll offer some comments, not in, in my written comments, I'll sort of follow along. I'm not gonna read them verbatim and they're not presented in any particular order. Um, but again, I didn't have as much time as I would like, but I, uh, I found a time to read uh, essentially through uh, the, the bulk of the report, not so much the, uh, the appendixes, um, but, um, I did, I did enjoy reading it this week. Uh, first comment I would make on the cost equity payment option, which I think is very interesting. Um, and I, you know, my general takeaway from that, I have been following the sort of the technical conversation on it. So I, I think it does need some other study, some more study. Um, one thing I noticed, particularly as I was reading some of the narrative that was included in the report around the context of Vermont and the history and so forth, is I think there should be a, a strand there on cost containment um, you know, cost containment, certainly you can make the case it's not directly related to the task force charge uh, on equalization, but the task force does raise a couple other of what I'd call design features that aren't not dir directly related either. And those would be uh, this idea of transparency and complexity, which I think appropriately the task force ra uh, raised and uh, particularly around the context of the cost equity payment option. And I think similarly, there should be some discussion there of cost containment. And that is one of the areas I would suggest we need to do further investigation on. Uh, there's been you know, so many different initiatives in the legislature and I cite a couple um, in my comments, Act 82 stands out to me having lived through that experience. Um, you know, There's been so many different legislative initiatives around the issue of cost containment because it's been a fairly common concern in the last 15 years as we saw costs increase at the same time the number of pupils was going down. Um, so I think, you know, <clears throat> the cost equity payment option is one of those things I would like to see evaluated a little more fully from the cost containment perspective, in particular, since we're contemplating um, doing something with the excess spending penalty threshold as part of an implementation or transition to uh, new weights or a new payment process. Um, so I think, you know, it's important that we uh, look at cost equity from a cost containment perspective, but especially so since um, if we're thinking of putting the excess spending threshold on hold for a bit, because uh, that, that has worked over the years. Uh, that's on my written testimony, that's number one. Uh, number two, uh, categorical grants. Um, I think, you know, there's a, an appropriate, very useful discussion of categorical grants. I, and I, again, have followed along some of the conversation of the task force uh, this summer and this, this fall on this topic. 
Um, I, I liked the, uh, I went out to some of the, the links in the report um, that really get into some of the detail. Again, a nice balance between the conception and also uh, getting into some of the mechanics of how it works in Vermont and how particularly categorical grants currently function relative to education spending. Um, I think there, I, I was unable, it wasn't clear to me, however, um, what the proposal would be for funding the categorical grants. And it's something I mentioned previously in my earlier testimony is a concern I have, you know, because we think of categorical, categorical grants often in the context of a foundation aid formula, uh, where a state provides a base amount and then categorical, categorical grants are layered on top of that. Um, and I think, you know, it's one of the things in, a, in this moment where we are looking at, uh, in, sorry, looking back in time since the inception of this funding system, um, and it's something that jumped out to me in my work with Act 173 as we contemplated special ed reimbursement versus special ed block grant, and also with construction aid. Um, we've always, uh, when we made this transition to a statewide funding system, I don't think we ever fully re evaluated the, the context of categorical grants because they're, you know, that we, we brought them forward uh, with the central funding system, but they were part of a, an earlier foundation aid process in Vermont. And this idea that uh, in traditionally in, in states that have a foundation aid system, uh, my observation would be that categorical grants function as sort of additional called supplemental funding on top of that base amount. Um, but it's important to acknowledge in Vermont that all, all of our categorical grants essentially uh, come from uh, the same funding source, the education fund. So as we contemplate using them, to what extent we'd use them as opposed to a weight, uh, I am concerned what I identify as uh, more uh, directly today in my written comments as re a recursive equity problem. You know, the idea that um, districts are paying for their own categorical grants and to what extent that, um, that sharing of that cost is done on an equitable basis could be a concern. So I would just point that out. It's something I mentioned uh, in my earlier testimony this summer. Uh, a third point, um, certainly uh, I support uh, addressing the issue of the small schools grant. I think, you know, there's strong consensus uh, in the field and uh, my experience that that's, uh, it's not functioning well. I think, um, you know, the, the idea of introducing a sparsity weight in the rural and also a consideration of the rural population density is a good one. And it's one of the, the innovations of the weighting study report that's really attractive to me. And I think, um, will be very interesting to other rural states as well. Um, one point we noted, um, you know, looking at just sort of the mechanics on implementation of this is that something you want to think about is there was some discussion of the, the merger incentive and grant program and how that functioned relative to the small schools grant that was part of Act 46. Uh, we just want to think about, um, you know, if, if districts have a foot in both of those worlds, so to speak, as we, uh, if we were to roll out a new weight for rurality or sparsity at the same time, students or districts are also participating in a merger incentive grant program, which was really a, a quote unquote substitute for the small, small schools grant. Um, Number four, uh, the English uh, language learners categorical aid. Um, it's in the last couple of weeks, particularly talking with our general counsel at the agency, uh, we're raising a concern around, uh, you know, raising a flag essentially around a potential civil rights issue. Uh, as you know, many of the students that are um, impacted by this categorical grant are also members of uh, protected classes of individuals. Um, it's just something I think uh, we should be cautious about singling out a, a funding approach uh, for them. Um, and I, you know, also um, I've heard from some of the districts, I'm sure as you have, are that would be uh, adversely impacted um, by a change here. I should say are, are concerned about not having adequate funding. So I think whatever we do, we need to be uh, addressing uh, the, the cost issue, the real cost issues that are associated with educating those students. Um, I don't. I don't think, as we originally envisioned this, it was um, truly tracked the cost. And I think it's one of the issues that emerged for the waiting study as well. That it was difficult to, um, I'm sure, as you know, to accommodate Vermont's sort of unique geographic pattern um, of cost that doesn't really compare to other places in New England very well. Um, number five, um, I support the modification of pre-K and the idea of. Um, putting off that a little bit into the future. I, I did want to surface for you, um, part of my rationale here might be a little different. Um, 
in that we've, we're starting to unpack uh, to a certain extent what will likely be a major new federal initiative in pre-K under the Build Back Better Act. Um, and I think the Build Back Better Act in terms of pre-K will become a, a major opportunity for us to um, sort of as a catalyst, if you will, to expand our pre-K programs. So I would argue that, uh, yes, it's important that we pause this conversation for a bit, um, not so much um, sort of out of the trajectory of how this policy but began, but in the context of looking at what could be a, I'm gonna say once in a lifetime, but a transformative event in terms of federal funding for pre-K. Um, and we, uh, we are starting to spend more in time on understanding how we could leverage uh, this new uh, opportunity to transform and expand our system. So I think it's a good time to just sort of put a little bit of a pause on that and to see what more we can do. Um, and I, you know, similar to the conversation on ELL that you had, um, I have some interest in, you know, what I've diagnosed as some patterns of um, inequity relative to pre-K and there's different need patterns across the state. And I think uh, that would be interesting to explore from a categorical, categorical aid perspective uh, as well, because I think there, there are likely some regions that deserve uh, additional emphasis over others, and um, that might be better achieved through a, a, category, a targeted categorical approach. Um, number six is really calling out the question of uh, the 173 uh, uh, transition from a block grant, uh, or excuse me, from a reimbursement model to a block grant. Um, I, you know, I agree this needs to be synchronized. And uh, particularly, I think now that we have a better understanding um, of the rules, the financial rules for 173, those essentially have been finished. Um, and as we get a better understanding of what's being proposed here in terms of the general funding system, now we need to go back and answer that question. Uh, that was raised uh, essentially through Act 173 is to what extent those school districts that have higher numbers of students with disabilities uh, have sufficient funding and to what extent that uh, funding needs to be accommodated in a block grant versus um, and or I should say uh, some change in the pupil weight. So now that we have a better understanding of, of how the block grant will work relative to the rules and, and we have some idea of how the weights might work um, or the, the change here, whether it's the, uh, the cost uh, payment option, we need to then just look at those districts that have, uh, look at the mon specific modeling for those districts that have higher numbers of students with disabilities and um, see what the impact is. Um, Number seven, I did. Um, I wasn't necessarily in agreement that there. Uh, maybe I misunderstood this, but um, under the additional recommendations section, there seemed uh, there was a mention that there needs to be a standard method to set public tuition. Um, I think that was uh, a conversation about how to perhaps build in weights into tuition and. Uh, I would just firstly, just maybe it's the wording that threw me, but um, I think we do have a, a standard method. That method exists. It's been well established. It's in the state law and so forth, and people know how to implement that. Um, if you're raising the issue of how to incorporate weights into tuition, I think I was just playing that out in my head. Uh, that's That can be very challenging to do. Um, I think, you know, because we have on the one hand, uh, in, in terms of tuitioning patterns, that happens on a, a very volatile basis, you know, students come and go and often tuition contracts and invoices are constructed on a uh, per diem basis because of that volatility. On the other hand, equalized uh, pupil amounts are a function of a two year average of ADM. So I, it's not clear to me how those two things would come together. But um, be something I guess to explore, but I did. I just point out maybe it was just the way the language was, but I think there is a uh, fairly standard and well established method for setting public tuition already. Uh, and then lastly, as I, I said orally, I think last time I was with you, I, I like the idea um, of a tax advisory committee, you know, the devil's in the details, so to speak, but um, I certainly would support reviewing that further and uh, would welcome the opportunity to have the agency uh, partner on that. Um, that concludes my sort of review of my written comments. I'd be happy to engage in a discussion or answer any questions you might have. Great. Thank you so much, Secretary French. Um, are there questions or comments for the secretary? I don't know if anyone else has questions. Representative Beck, did you? I heard you. No. no. Okay. Uh, Representative Kornheiser. Um, Thanks, Secretary French. Your concerns around the English language learner grant, um, are those 
more around ensuring that the grant amount is sufficient to meet the needs and that the quantity of the grant or the um, level of the grant is non-discriminatory or is it the actual nature of a categorical grant that is concerning to you? Yeah, thank you. Um, I can say just on a sort of a narrative basis, my as I watch the, the technical conversation unfold, um, you know, albeit at a distance, uh, my, my initial concern was on the amount. Um, and I was watching that conversation closely and engaging, I'm sure as you have with districts that would be impacted by this. Uh, more recently, um, we have started to have a conversation from a, a purely civil rights perspective of calling out the specific um, a difference in a funding approach for a group that also coincidentally has a large number of students who are members of protected classes. So that's that's a more recent concern for us in the last couple of weeks that we've started to focus in on and have to start to have some conversation about. At this point, I would just raise that as a flag of concern. Okay. Are there other questions? <clears throat> Um, I just wanted to uh, mention the, your, your comments on the small schools and merger support grants. I'm um, just out of clarification. The report does say that the, the small schools, that a district couldn't get a small school's weight and a merger support grant. So if okay. they, they apply or if they, they get the weight they wouldn't also get the merger support grant so I, I mean we can make that stronger to clarify but i just wanted to make sure that you did understand we were we're not proposing some kind of double dip or whatever the right yeah that's part. great i mean i again i didn't have a lot of time to delve into that uh, yeah. and read the draft but you know again to your credit i mean you've you've got those nuances that uh oftentimes we don't pick up in policy until after implementation so good for you uh, Representative Kornheiser. Um, I just wanted to, on the English language learners, just want to sort of follow up and make sure that our council is in touch with your council, because um, I think the intent is actually around protecting and ensuring protections for a protected class. That was a ridiculous sentence, sorry. Um, and so want to make sure that we're sort of all on the same page with that intent um, as we continue the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll be happy to work with you on that. Thanks. Um, are there other questions or comments for the secretary? Well, thank you so much, Secretary French, for being with us and for all of your engagement on this process throughout the last couple of years during a very difficult time. And there's certainly more to come in the next session. Yeah, no, thank you again. I think you, you guys have done a really good job on this and um, I look forward to supporting those future deliberations. Thank you. Uh, hold on just one second. If I could also, I just want to thank you um, for freeing up the staff resources to um, in the form of um, Brad to spend the time with us to really understand all the data that you all have in front of you. So thank you for that. <coughs> yeah, just after that, we could, we literally could not have done this work without Brad. So thank you so much for, for loaning him to us for this purpose. <laughs> yeah, he's, he does really good work. <laughs> Thank you, Secretary French. No. Thank you. Have a good day. Okay. Um, next up, we have Anor Horton. Anor, are you on the screen? Yes, there you are. Good morning. Hello, yes. Thanks for being with us. If you want to just say who you are and then take it away. Great. Um, I'm Anor Horton, and I'm the Executive Director of Hunger Free Vermont. And I really appreciate the opportunity to come and first of all, just applaud and express um, my deep gratitude for the incredibly hard and thoughtful and, and smart work of this task force. Um, I read, I have read the entire draft report and I just think that you all grappled with uh, many, many really difficult issues um, in such a thoughtful way. And I just so appreciate and I'm honored by the opportunity to have contributed um, a very small amount to this process. So um, really, really appreciate the work. Um, I am here just to speak on a, a very specific aspect of the report, and that is the recommendations um, that the task force is making in this draft report to um, the way that poverty is measured for the purposes of implementing 
whatever approach uh, to providing additional um, educational supports to low-income students uh, the legislature ultimately chooses to take uh, on the basis of the task force's work. So um, Hunger Free Vermont really strongly supports the recommendation of the task force to change the measure of poverty from SNAP enrollment to enrollment in free and reduced price school meals or FRL. Um, as the task force accurately notes in the draft report, um, SNAP enrollment uh, pretty dramatically undercounts the number of households uh, and particularly the number of households with children living in poverty and free and reduced lunch um, enrollment in free and reduced meal programs in the state um, better counts the number of students um, living in, in poverty in Vermont. Although it is still an undercount as the, the draft report accurately notes. So, but we support that as an interim step um, and, and really uh, applaud that change. Uh, we also support the recommendation um, in the report um, to develop a universal income declaration form and to have that form be used by all school districts. Uh, that's really important because there is a, a pretty significant distinction between who's eligible for means-tested programs like SNAP and FRL and who enrolls in them. And a form that all households uh, with children in schools would complete that is not tied to um, an application for any particular federal program would close that gap between uh, who's enrolled in those programs and who's eligible for those programs. And so that form would much more accurately capture the true number of students who um, the legislature determines to be eligible to receive additional educational supports based on their household income. Um, so we, we really appreciate and strongly support um, all of those recommendations. We also support the recommendation that the Agency of Education convene a study group that includes um, folks on the ground in schools who are using these forms and uh, also anti-hunger advocates um, and other um, advocates who uh, work with people living in poverty to um, develop this universal income declaration form. Our one additional request would be that this task force place uh, a timeline on that form development and implementation. So um, I won't, uh, I know schools are dealing with a lot right now, and this would be an additional change. I know the Agency of Education is dealing with a lot right now. And at the same time, I think it's gonna be more and more critical, particularly if um, universal school meals continues to grow in Vermont as we expect that it will um, rapidly, that this form be available as soon as possible. And so some kind of by when and deadline um, on that the development of the form would be um, really useful, I think. Um, the one other uh, thing that I'll, I'll say is that I think there's some language discrepancies in the draft report um, having to do with these recommendations. And um, I am going, I am gonna submit just a, a written document uh, for the committee that explains those rather than taking this time publicly. It's a, it's a minor language shift, but I think it, um, that perhaps the task force's intentions aren't completely being accurately represented everywhere in the report. Um, and that language change has to do with the difference between enrollment and eligibility in SNAP and FRL. Um, so that is everything that I wanted to, to say in response to this draft report. Again, um, thank you all so much for so carefully and thoughtfully grappling with the challenge of how we measure poverty and how we um, count 
low-income students and identify those students and make sure that they um, have their educational needs met. So thank you all so much for your time and your attention. Thank you, Anor. Are there any questions or comments at the moment for Ms. Horton? I, uh, Representative Kornheiser, can you, it's been such a long time since we first started this conversation with you. And I wonder if you could um, do a brief rehash of the regional disparities in enrollment in um, any, either of those. Oh, in certainly. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, so I don't have um, specific numbers at my fingertips, but um, so let's start with SNAP. So there, SNAP um, application, there is a SNAP application that is online and that is uh, in the fastest and most effective way for people to enroll in SNAP. But of course, uh, given our situation that you all know very well, um, with broadband access and disparities in that in the state and um, people um, who are low income and likely eligible for SNAP are less likely to have access to computers at home. Um, that makes enrollment in SNAP challenging in the many areas of our state that don't have reliable internet access and where people don't have reliable access to um, computers um, where they need them in order to enroll in the program. There also are a lot of documents um, associated with applying for SNAP that need to be provided um, and reviewed by um, state agency workers uh, as required by the federal government. And those documents can theoretically be uploaded to the system um, from home. Uh, but again, that requires um, uh, accurate, uh, that requires uh, effective access to the internet and um, the ability to uh, scan documents or access documents online. And so there's just a, a, incredible disparities um, around our state, especially in rural areas for how far people have to travel to get to um, an economic services division office where they can um, do this enrollment process in person or to have um, somebody who works for a community action agency or an area agency on aging um, or the Vermont Food Bank uh, provide direct application assistance for someone. And of course, the COVID pandemic has made doing that in-person work even more difficult um, and, and, and um, problematic than it was before. So, that's SNAP. Um, in terms of um, free and reduced uh, price meal applications, so th those applications are distributed by every school in Vermont. And so access to those applications is less disparate depending on whether you live in a rural or urban area of Vermont. However, um, different school districts allocate different um, amounts of funding and have different levels of staff capacity to um, actually do the work that's required to get those applications returned from families. Um, and so we know that um, the applications may be received by every family, um, but they are received in different ways and getting them returned can be a significant challenge for schools. We know that schools that uh, spend the money and use the staff time to individually mail applications separately uh, from all the rest of the school information packets at the beginning of the year out to families with a uh, stamped return address uh, have a much higher rate of return for those applications, for example, but not every school district um, has the resources to carry out that kind of school meal application campaign every year. That's just one example of the kind of access disparities that um, can happen with those forms. Was I answer, am I answering the question? That was um, perfect, thank you. Okay, great. Is there anything else you wanted me to touch on that I didn't in that answer? No, that was completely comprehensive. Thank you. <laughs> okay, great. 
say that. Is there anything else at this moment? Excellent. Thank you so much, Anor, and thank you for engaging with us in this conversation. It's been really nice to have someone who's very focused on one part of it, not the other rest of it. So um, we appreciate you really um, thinking this through with us and uh, providing a recommendation. So thank you for being here with us today. It's, it's really been my honor to be part of this really important process. Thank you all so much for your work. Take good Thanks. care. You too. Bye-bye. Um, we had one other witness um, who is one of the represents one of the organizations that we are um, under Act 59 supposed to check back in with, and that is the School Boards Association. But Sue Siglowski um, was not able to be with us today. She did submit written testimony, which you could pull up right now and read in about two minutes, um, uh, basically saying that they did not have time to read the report and are not submitting any opinions until they can do it, and so won't weigh in until January. Um, but she, you know, you can read that. So we just wanted for the record to know, everybody to know that we did invite the school boards association and um, they were not able or uh, able to be here or provide comprehensive testimony. Um, so that concludes our witnesses for the morning. Um, so we have a couple options here. We can start sort of going through the report with Catherine Benham from JFO we can have a committee discussion right now about what we've heard. We could take an early lunch. Um, we have some, do we have public testimony, Sorsha? Um, nothing certain yet. Bill Mathis is potential. Okay, so we might have one person, but they're not available yet. So um, uh, what is the preference of the task force? Um, early lunch. Early, <laughs> early lunch, I hear. Yeah, early lunch, and then we can come back and hear from Catherine. Okay, so if it's 11.30, if we wanna take lunch until 12.30, wait, what were you gonna say? I'm sorry. Um, can it be 12.45? Teachers. Oh, cause you have your thing. Yeah. Are you gonna be done by 12.45? I'll be done by 12. Okay, so um, we can take an hour and 15 minutes. I just want everybody to know we have a lot to get through this afternoon. So I guess since we have to wait for Emily to do her thing at lunch, I. I actually would prefer that we start going through the report. What, how about instead of going through the report right now, we spend 15 minutes just reflecting on what we heard this morning okay. and things that stood out for us from this morning. Okay, so, that's fine. I just want to make sure we're using yes. our time wisely because I don't want to drive home too late. It's supposed to be freezing rain. I have to go over the mountain. So um, I'd rather not spend super long time. And we do have a little after task force um, closure things to take care of. So. Um, so why don't we spend some time um, talking right now for 15 minutes and then we'll take an hour lunch from 11.45 to 12.45. Does that work for folks? Sure. Okay. Who wants to start off? What, what, what did you hear that was interesting or whatever? <laughs> what do you have to say about this morning? <laughs> Senator Brock. Well, um, I think we've said it before. Uh, one of the things that's... Uh, continuing to concern me is that almost the universe of comment that we have is contrary to some of the things that we are planning to do. There's a strong uh, uh, trust among people and Dr. Lynn from Winooski, I think said it, said it best, uh, that our choice of categorical grants, for example, and our choice to consider the cost weighting model contrary to what Professor Colby said, uh, is concerning to a lot of districts. And although we may believe that we have cogent reasons for doing the things that we're doing, it's, I think, evident to me, and I think we talked about it briefly at the break, that that message isn't getting through to a lot of the audience who's listening to us. And that is a concern uh, that you know, when you issue a report that I don't know that I've heard anybody Who's come to us and said you guys are absolutely on the right track with respect to these things it's been almost a hundred percent the opposite when i look at that and i compare it to some of the comments and warnings if you will that professor colby gave us this morning that adds to my concern so that i think we should put that out on the table uh, uh, if we are are convinced that the things that we are suggesting uh, or at least so far that have been discussed as being suggesting are the right approaches, particularly the categorical grant 
and also, uh, uh, you know, our, our look at the cost benefit model. Are we sure we're doing the right thing here? And if we are, is there a better way to communicate it so that others believe it as well? Representative Pomlin, thank you, Senator Brooks. So I guess I would respond to that by saying, you know, uh, what we have introduced is a concept that, have, that heretofore has never been discussed before. Mm -hmm. And to think that all of a sudden people will have a, a grasp of it and why we're doing it um, uh, straight away uh, is fairly optimistic. And I think that, you know, we put it out there as an alternative. We don't say we absolutely think you need to go in this direction. Um, and I, but I think it, for a lot of reasons that we don't, that are, that are so in the weeds, we don't really talk about publicly. Um, I'm very comfortable throwing it out there as an alternative. I mean, it simplifies the equation. Uh, it, 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 and a lot of the things that, that Professor Colby talked about were trade-offs and they, they are the same trade-offs that exist within the pupil weighting system that we use. Um, and we, so everything that she said, well, this is a trade-off that you have. Well, you can really say that about the, you know, if it can be politicized. Well, sure, at the state level it could be, but at the local level it can't be uh, with weights. Uh, so, you know, I don't feel like we're advocating one one strongly over the other, but I do think we are introducing a, a intriguing new concept that is worthy of further discussion. Uh, Senator Perchlick, sorry. Um, to that point, Senator Brockway, on the, the one point we're not doing that is with the ELL categorical grants, and I guess it just to, to the point is we we could do the same thing there of saying here's here's why we're suggesting it. here's the trade offs of doing it as a categorical grant versus weights. We didn't do that with that. We did it with everything else. So if we wanted to address that issue in the report, we we could be more. We could we could present it as a more of an option and 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 work as the committees work through these things that they they look at it as as an option depending on how other things play out. We, we obviously don't know what the end result of any of this will be and what the legislature will ultimately adopt, whether they will adopt option A, B, C, or C two A subparagraph D of what we suggest. Uh, that's why I do think that the look back that we are putting in in terms of audit of did whatever gets done actually do what was intended to be done is critically important. But I think that it is also critically important for there to be credibility for the work that we've actually done that how we communicate this to the public is so important and it's clear that it has not been communicated well if nobody seems to be in favor of doing what we're proposing to do, or at least of those that we've heard loudly, I'll put it that way. Senator Hooker. I was gonna agree with Senator Brock and Senator Perchlick about the idea that, that we need to know what we're selling here for one thing. And, you know, we've talked a little bit about there are many ways to do this. And maybe it just needs to be clarified that these recommendations are a couple of ways that we've discussed and come up with. But I, I have serious concerns when the majority of the testimony that we've heard throughout this process has opposed ELF. Um, the categorical grants for ELL. And I'm not sure, you know, if the recommendations or the, the concerns that we've been presented with um, are accurate, except that these are people on the ground. And they're the ones that I think have the most um, knowledge of, you know, what this funding situation is going to present to them. So I, I really, I still have serious concerns about um, sending this report out without, at least without saying, these are possible options and I appreciate the options and I appreciate the work of this committee. And I certainly appreciate some of the things that we've done with changing the policies for measuring poverty the idea of the committee, the advisory committee is a great idea. Senator Brock, your, your comments about um, 
accountability are certainly well taken. We've done a lot of work here, but I think that it has to be very clear that, you know, this is what we've done. And there, these may help, these may be possibilities, but there are other possibilities as well. And if I could feel comfortable that we're not just going to send this report out and that it's, um, you know, the, the work that'll be done is just going to follow these recommendations, then I guess, you know, I could support the report, but I, I still have serious concerns and uh, the concerns that the uh, that witnesses are voicing are making me even more concerned. Representative Beck. Um, mostly I, I echo what uh, Representative Conn said. I think I'm perfectly comfortable proposing cost equity as a suggested idea to the um, to the legislature i mean it it solves a major equity problem in our existing funding system it's more understandable as peter said i mean all of the you know the red flags or the things that you want to look at doing this are the same for doing waiting and as far as the the, the people that have been critical they really all come from one group um, and I think they, they are, to a large degree, missing the fundamental dif difference between um, a self-balancing education fund and a fund that works on a budget, of which the other 49 do, and we do not. And so all of that, I, I am perfectly comfortable suggesting a cost equity approach as, as one of the approaches that we're going to put in this report. Yeah. Um, what I heard this morning was that we need to provide more clarity on what the cost equity proposal is and isn't. What I heard from Professor Colby wasn't actually a critique of the cost equity formula. It was suggestions on considerations we should take going forward as we discuss it. And I heard her repeat that particular frame many times throughout her testimony, that they were not criticisms, they were frames for the future conversation to make sure we're fully fleshing out our ideas. And in the report, I think we, in the first round, did our best to try to be clear that we understand there's a lot more to understand about the cost equity approach because it's new um, and that the numbers you know, are new and that the implications of it are new. And I appreciated that she shared the pieces that need to be taken into consideration as we explore it. I think many of them are the exact same trade-offs that we have with waiting, um, but because the waiting isn't new, we didn't hear about the, the trade-offs with waiting, even though we spent a lot of time as a task force discussing the trade-offs with waiting. Um, and so for me, providing two paths and saying one path requires more exploration isn't a firm endorsement of that second path. It's saying that this is a real opportunity for us to understand this issue better. And I appreciate the feedback this morning about it because they're the places for me that I know we need to be either explaining better or exploring better. Um, I heard a few times from folks about how the cost equity model was sort of a way to, um, it was perceived as a way to support districts that were gonna have reduced tax capacity. And while I wish that was true, it's not. It actually has a stronger tax impact on those districts, which I think is one of the concerns for me with cost equity. And so for me, that just pointed to um, a clarity issue in the report, which is a draft and that's great that there were clarity issues. Um, I also didn't hear across the board dismissal of our proposals. I heard a few dismissals of our proposals. I heard a few very specific places where they would, folks would like clarity. Um, and I'm really grateful for those. The, on the ELL, um, the amount, I think a lot of people are really, really concerned about the amount of the ELL grant, which is very, very like super legitimate critique. Um, from an equity perspective, from a how is my district going to make out? This is terrifying perspective. You know, people are worried about 173 and that has, people haven't been clear on how much money they're getting from that. But I think that um, we're waiting on this memo from Professor Colby that provides the cost equivalencies. And I think when we have those numbers, it's a very different conversation 
around ELL with regards to um, issues of discrimination. Um, and I don't, Jim is here if we like, I think if we wanna hear more about sort of his thoughts on protected classes in the context of English language learning, but um, I think the piece that's, and I would defer to the person chairing the meeting today about whether or not we're gonna hear from him, but I, I think the issue of discrimination there sits with the actual amount that we'd be allocating. It's not the fact that it's a separate categorical grant. And what I heard from, to continue breathing and speaking, um, what I heard from Secretary French specifically, very explicitly, and I heard implicitly from a bunch of other people is what Representative Beck just said about, I don't think we did as much as we could to highlight the very specific aspects of the education fund and how they are different from other ways we raise revenue in state government and other, the way other states raise revenue. And I think most of our, I think a lot of our emotional experiences of the word grant and a lot of um, most professionals experience of that word and formulas, it sort of sits on this idea of a fund that isn't self-balancing. Um, so I feel, I guess I feel really good about the recommendations still. I just saw a bunch of points where I really wanna make sure we provide more clarity on the position that the task force has taken. Do we wanna hear, Jim popped up on the screen. Do, do we wanna hear his thoughts on um, uh, the equity issues or the discrimination issues with the ELL? Uh, Senator Perchlick, did you wanna? Uh, I mean, I don't think we need to, I mean, but I'm happy to hear it if others do, but that is something when, when you asked the question, what did we hear this morning? It is something that I thought differently this morning about how we offer two options, except with the ELL, where we have a clear recommendation. So I think we could talk more about how the, how, why that is, and, you know, why it is that we feel strongly about that as a categorical grant, but we're offering options on all the other costs. And so I, and the way I think of it, it's more like we're either do cost equity for everything or we would do weights for everything. Um, so I think we could we could couch that differently in the report, or at least I'm seeing that differently as more of a uh, options, or if if we're not don't want to do it as options, be more clear of why it stands alone. Jim, do you, do you have just a brief? Um, response to the concerns. I don't know if you heard that the concerns that were raised by Secretary French and and our discussion just now about the ELL categorical aid and the potential for um, protected class concerns. Yeah. So for the record, uh, Jim Damory, that, that's consul. I did hear Secretary French's testimony, and the concern he raised really goes to the fact that. Um, EOL students are primarily uh, from other places of origin than the United States. So um, also are often people of color. Um, and therefore we have at least two or three um, protected classes uh, within the category of ELL students uh, under the Equal Protection Clause of the US Constitution. So we will, wouldn't be having this conversation so much if, if we're talking about a wait for uh, elementary or high school students, um, but we're talking about um, students who are within protected classes. And therefore, we can expect if a court looked at this uh, on a challenge that there was discrimination against these students, we can expect the court to apply a very high standard of review, which is to say, the court would likely be looking at a standard that says that the um, legislation is, is uh, constitutional um, only if it is um, uh, narrowly tailored to meet a compelling state interest, which is a very high bar to get by. So the, um, the thing that I think Secretary French was focused on is the amount of the grant um, and the fact that you've got uh, empirically derived uh, amounts for the weights based on costs. Um, and a question asked to um, whether, whether that same process has been done for this area of categorical aid. 
I believe it's being done, according to um, Coach Kornheiser, mentioned it's being done. So I think once that's done, um, I think we can look at this question again and see whether the new amount raises the same concerns. The method uh, is different than the weights as well. I think you've got good reasons for your method, um, whether they're compelling or not, I'm not sure, but obviously you're trying to deal with smaller schools, get money to them more equitably. Um, so I think you've got good reasons for taking possibly a different approach here. My area of concern mainly at this stage is with the verifying that the amount reflects uh, costs. Great, any questions for, for Jim? Um, Representative James. Thanks. Um, probably a, a pretty basic question, but I, I've been really struggling with, the, with, with this, you know, sort of feeling that this might be discriminatory because, because it's so clearly not our intent. Uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> profoundly not our intent. Um, isn't, isn't special ed a categorical program? And isn't that a protected class of students? So why is that not problematic? Special ed under the Equal Protection Clause, it's certainly true under the IDEA, okay? No question about that. I'm talking about the Equal Protection Clause analysis. And I have to go back, James, I was looking at this from a perspective, not other perspectives. So I have to go back and see to the extent to which equal protection would apply to special education students. I'm sure it does in some way, but I'm not sure the analysis is exactly the same as I'm giving you for this question on EOL. Yeah, I'm just curious. I, I just feel like there are all kinds of ways in our society and in, uh, you know, that we try to make sure that, you know, more vulnerable or at risk categories of people or students have the resources they need. And that's what we're trying to do here. So, right. yeah. yeah, yeah. So your intent, I mean, and it's true that the uh, challenge under the Equal Protection Clause requires both adverse effect on that class and intent, uh, discriminatory intent, which you obviously don't have. But that would be a court analysis as to how, how to determine intent. So it's a tough test to actually get by. Um, but the overall concern is that you're dealing with a class of people who are protected here. So I just think that your focus is right to be in this area and ensuring that the amount lines up to what you believe the cost is or is fair. Uh, Representative Beck. I guess I, I just, I'm, you don't need to respond to this, Jim, but I just really want to learn more about this because I know there are states out there that are like giving ELL students less than a hundred bucks. So I, I guess I need to learn more about this. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, that was true. That was very clear from the cross state yeah. comparison that, that right. no st <laughs> only two states give more than what was um, in the, um, and, and I, I appreciate your question about special ed because that's what I thought too. Um, and yes, our intent absolutely, in fact, is actually to protect against potential yes. discrimination right. at the local level. It is exactly the opposite of what you know people's co raising concerns today about um, so uh, representative Collin. so jim um do weights solve that concern the weights don't solve that concern. well the weight in tammy professor colby's october 28th memo she lays out a weight for ELL if you chose to go that way. That is what she's redoing now, I believe, to turn to a categorical aid amount uh, based on cost analysis. So it's not that weight, a weight solves it or <clears throat> either way, weight or, or, um, or a categorical, categorical aid, either way, obviously you want the weight or the aid to affect the actual costs uh, for educating ELL students. That's your goal, right? So I don't think it matters so much as to which way you go, as long as you get the, the amount equitable in, for this class of, of, of students. And is, there's no, 
there, I guess there's no guarantee that the way we have been doing it addresses that. I mean, I assume the way we have been doing it is just as challengeable as any other uh, scenario you've laid out. I suppose so, but what, what you're doing now is in a different context. So now you're looking at the whole system, right? You're doing this big review of the whole system. You're saying for everything else, we're going to wait this, but on this point here, we're going to pull it out as a, as a, as a grant, basically, or aid, and you're going to fund it a certain way. So a court looking at this scenario would look at your, what you're doing to, in this area for a protected class versus what you've done overall in trying to solve this problem. So I appreciate that there might be, you can look, think of different examples or where we are now or different states, but we're in a certain context here which I think is relevant to how a court would look at this. Okay, yeah. Senator Perchley. I, I think to represent the Collins point, well, we're almost just pushing it down to the local level. Like you said earlier about the politicalization of the funding, instead of at the state level, it would be at the local level with waves. And same with here. Like if there was a, a case of for discrimination, maybe it would be at the local level. It's kind of like the discussion we had with mask mandates. Is it a state issue or a or a town issue. And I think we did, because we thought it was protecting these classes is why we wanted the categorical grade to the small schools. And one thing new I did hear was Dr. Ian for the coalition saying that they supported the categorical grants to these smaller schools because they realized that was a, was a problem. Um, so that, that was another new thing where, where we might want to lay those out. And the other thing I heard, I think it was from Karen Horn was we might want to put in there in case some in case the legislature does do weights for ELL that we should include legislation that requires that the money be spent for the ELL. She made it seem like it was possible. I'm not sure what she was talking about, but if, if there was a way of doing that, that would be part of my recommendation. Just saying, okay, if for whatever reason you don't feel like ELL can be done with grants, well, here here's how you should protect those classes with language requiring that they spend the money. Which I don't know if it's how we do that. We haven't yeah. talked about Yeah, I don't think that, I mean, the weights are, the way the current system works, it's, it's just local control of determining a budget. And as we saw that districts have wide varying budgets for ELL under our current system. Right. I don't think that would change with changing the weights necessarily yeah. And if you start to mandate it, then, you, then you're basically doing a categorical grant, except for you're not funding it the way you would fund a categorical grant. Right. I think, yeah, it's just a, a new idea that I hadn't heard before is could we mandate it a different way, I guess. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. Maybe Kathleen or I, Sam James. Yeah. I thought what, um, I thought what, is it Dr. Yen? I, I, I don't know. Yeah. I thought what Dr. Yen was suggesting was a hybrid approach in which the the ELL would be handled through a weight, but we would we would offer some sort of minimum, mm -hmm. right? Okay, so that's that's different, I think. From right, we had talked about that at one point. I thought we had talked about that as as an approach. Um, yeah, I guess um, a more thorough explanation in the report and um, and not just an explanation or justification for what we're trying to do, but of how it would look if we go the other way. You know, what the options are down that path. I think it's probably a good idea. I think one concern I have with the weight itself is that there's a lot of evidence in the report and Professor Col Colby did not address it today, but it's addressed in the report about how that weight is one that's very problematic. That it's hard, it was harder for the researchers to get an accurate weight because of the sort of concentration of students and the uneven distribution of students. And I think, well, actually she did mention, you know, in a, like California, it would be easier to come up with a, a, an accurate empirically derived weight, but in, in the context of our Vermont, it, it's not. And that's, I, that, that was my sort of first concern about ELL is the weights don't quite work in the way that they do for, for poverty, which is much more spread out and obviously the grade levels, which is much more spread out. And even small schools, we have, they're more spread out. And so it just seems to me that if we rely 
fully on the weight, it's not as accurate and it's not as good of a measure as um, the other weights. And it skews the, the distribution of funds across or the distribution of tax capacity across the state in a way that I think enhances inequity. And that's one of my main concerns. And in addition to the concern about, you know, the challenges on the local level with this issue and, and wanting to make sure that regardless, like, you know, Senator Brock's story that he's told many times that, that, um, that regardless of where you go to school, you are going to get the same excellent at, at ELL services. And, and obviously, clearly, the amount is what really matters. But I also think it's the way we distribute those funds and the sort of accountability that we embed in the distribution of those funds that is going to ensure equity um, much better than just leaving it in the weight, weighting formula and sort of burying it in formula. Um, are there other questions for Jim? Um, thank you, Jim, for, for being here for us. Um, uh, we'll, we're gonna take our lunch break now unless there's any final thoughts. Um, Senator Brock. So, so that I don't forget it, because I think it's important. Um, regardless of, of what we do and how we do what we do, one of the biggest concerns I have in all of this is, are we doing something or recommending something that will increase the cost of education in the bond? That to me is an extremely important issue. I think it's extremely important to taxpayers who are concerned about education, delivery quality education, but they're also concerned about property tax rates and whether or not in doing what we're doing, uh, my thought as we started out was our goal was to take uh, essentially the amount of money, and I know that an indirect way of describing it, that we are spending on education and simply spend it differently and more equitably and distribute it better to uh, ensure equal opportunity for students. I'm concerned in some of the things that we may be doing and the way we may be doing it, though, what we're actually doing in addition to that is increasing the cost of education in a state that has some of the highest education taxes and the highest education spending already of any state in the country. And it's just something I think we should be looking at and thinking about. Yeah, and to that point, there is a section of the report that addresses that yeah. and talks about it. And it, it's true for the weights too. Yeah. Absolutely true for changing the weights. And it's true for the cost equity formula. There, there, it's equally possible that we would increase the cost in ways that we may not, I'm not um, sure, but yes. that may not uh, intend. Um, I know that Emily has to go, so I just want to be conscious of her, um, uh, but uh, Senator Hooker. Just, just a really quick comment about um, the impact that sent, uh, Professor Colby's comment about, you know, it's something new and shiny is what we're putting out here. And the idea of um, weights and categorical grants have pros and cons to them. Maybe that should be included in the report as well to show, you know, if you're gonna have the same problems, whether it's weights or categorical grants, you're gonna have the same um, advantages, whether it's weights or categorical grants, so that when other legislators read the report, they understand, they can see the comparison and see that either way, you're gonna have pros and cons, but I think it, it needs to be clarified and, and I don't think it is in the report. Okay, so we're gonna take our break right now. Um, if you are looking for something in the report,